Hi loves, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are filming, hopefully I can get through, the long anticipated video about how I grew up in a cult. Yes, I really did. It's not clickbait. So if you're interested in learning about how I was in a religious cult when I was little, please keep watching. Okay, you guys have asked for more of my personal story times. If you're new here, usually we talk about prison wife, life stuff. My husband's incarcerated. He is serving 213 years for robberies where nobody was hurt. And I use my years of experience to help prison wives and family members feel educated, empowered, supported, and loved, not only while their loved one is incarcerated, but also long after they get out. We do not glorify or glamorize prison life. We are trying to break statistics. We are trying to beat stigma and we are trying to make the best out of this one shot deal. If you are interested in any of that or about me, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. I'm also the author of a book called The Comeback Code. But today we're a little bit off topic because I've teased this video for a really long time and also a lot of you guys have asked me for more personal stories about myself. So we're gonna throw some in here and there. This video has been really hard for me to make. The reason I've been teasing it for so long is just because it's brought up a lot of stuff. I just sat down to make it last weekend and I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. A couple people asked me about it and I said, you guys just have to give me some grace. There's a lot of trauma involved in this. And also I said that I was gonna make this video with my best friend who was in this religious cult for longer than I was. We met when we were seven years old at summer camp. So I guess it was cult summer camp because it was summer camp that this sleepaway camp that this cult sponsor put on. It was cray cray. I should do a whole video all about sleepaway cult camp. We weren't allowed to eat unless we sang hymns for our food, like weird stuff, weird stuff, you guys. Anyway, so this will probably be a series, but Mary and I have not been able to coordinate our schedules and I don't wanna force her to do it if she doesn't wanna do it, of course. So know that that video will probably come in the future, but I figured I would give you a part one by myself while I have some time to just sit down and do this. I actually today listened to a podcast that one of my friends sent who was raised very similar to me, but she was in an evangelical type of setting. And as we've been kind of communicating back and forth about our pasts, it's very, very, very similar. So I listened to a podcast that she sent me right before making this. And in there, the guest was saying that they're actually diagnosing PTSD related to severely religious restrictive upbringings and there's actually a lot of trauma associated with that and now they're diagnosing it as PTSD which some people can be kind of oh my god trauma is saved for veterans and trauma is saved for prison and trauma is saved for people who have experienced the most awful things in the world but it was really traumatic as I walk you guys through this stuff and all the anxieties. And I think I'll save the worst part and what I believe has caused the most anxiety for me for the last, for the end of it, because it's really hard for me to talk about. I'm not going to use the name of the cult because I like my life. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But they don't come after you like or anything like that. It was not. But I still don't feel like it's necessary for me to say the name. I'm not trying to call anybody out or anything like that, but it was a religious organization and they did attach themselves to the Catholic church until they got booted by the Catholic church, but we were Catholic. My parents were introduced to this cult through their friends from church. We were living on Long Island at the time and the headquarters for the cult was in New Jersey. They were moving and my parents remained friends with them and they used to take them to what they called community gatherings. The name of the cult was not the community, but that's what everybody called it was the community. So that's probably what I'll refer to it here. So I don't refer to it by its name. And I could call my friend right now and be like, blah, 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 I have a question about the community. And she would be like, oh yeah, she would know exactly what I was talking about. My parents went a couple of times and they really liked it. I was actually asking my dad questions the other day for this video and he said, what we really liked about it when we first got into it was the kids seemed so respectful. If an older person or a woman walked into the room and a boy was sitting down, they would jump up and they would give her their seat. He said, the kids seemed so polite, so respectful that we wanted you to be raised like that. We appreciated that because that's kind of chivalry is dead. It's kind of a lost art. He said, but what we didn't realize was those kids were led by so much fear that it wasn't necessarily 
something inherent that they wanted to do. It was something that if they didn't do it, they would fear being beaten. They would fear going to hell. They would fear all of these crazy repercussions from the elders in the community. I should, probably should have said this first. This organization was started by two men who were working on Wall Street. This was back in, I believe, the early 80s. There was a lot of speculation a few years ago when the show The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu first came out because the men in the cult that I was in used to call their wives their handmaidens. So a lot of people speculated that The Handmaid's Tale, the book, which was written in the early 80s, was written after this cult inspired it. But as I watched The Handmaid's Tale, and as I divulged more into that, I think it's the opposite because the book actually, it's debunked. The book came out prior to, just prior to this cult. I think one of the founders of this cult got their hands on that book and they decided to design something very similar. Ugh. If you have ever seen The Handmaid's Tale, ugh. It was not nearly as traumatic. That was more of a dramatized, enhanced version, but... Basically, they were trying to create their own Handmaid's Tale. Originally, it was two men from Wall Street and they were the coordinators. And then they had, and that's what you used to call them was the coordinators. There were about five or six coordinators and their families. And they built all of these gorgeous houses on this one street, this one kind of country street in the area. And everybody aspired to date a coordinator's son or to get invited to a coordinator's kid's house because they were the higher ups. They were the ones that called the shots. Again, it was an entity of the Catholic church, but the bishop said that they could practice as long as they fell in line with the hierarchy of the Catholic church. Well, eventually as these two people and then the other six coordinators got more and more power among this cult and this group and it started to grow, that wasn't enough for them. And they came back and they said, no, we're gonna be bigger than the church. We're gonna have more power than the church. More power than the Roman Catholic Church. So they got booted and kicked out. And then they created their own school where I went to for sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade. My sister went there for ninth, 10th, and 11th, and she has a lot more trauma than I do. I was a little bit younger and a little bit more shielded from it. But originally, the kids that went to the regular Catholic school, they were very, very, very bullied. They were teased. They were called this awful name. So let's say that the cult was called, uh, let me think of a word. Let's say the cult was called Let There Be Light, which it's not even close. But let's just say it was called Let There Be Light. The kids were called lighties and they stood out like sore thumbs. The ladies are here, stay away from the ladies, the weird kids, the ladies. The rules were that the women had to be extremely submissive to the men. Women were not allowed to wear anything other than long dresses or skirts. I remember that they called these things jumpers. Usually their clothes were homemade and it was kind of like a square piece here. And then it went into this long, very frumpy dress and they would wear their own either t-shirt or button down high neck shirt underneath it. So not like the Amish, but kind of a little bit Amish. If I could find anything that looks like it online, I'll post a picture. Definitely had to be a long skirt. Definitely had to be high neck. No jeans, no pants for women whatsoever. That was a one way ticket to hell. We were not allowed to listen to the radio at all. Secular music was, it was gonna send you straight to hell. And what else was there? Oh my gosh, there was so much stuff. I tried to prepare for this, you guys, but it was bringing up so much and then it was just taking longer and longer and longer. And so many people were asking for it. So I decided just to sit down and speak from the heart. So I think like a lot of things, you guys are gonna be like, well, that's not that bad, but it's because I'm forgetting. So I'll give you the gist of what I remember and then I'll listen to more of that book that I was listening to and more of the podcast and talk more to my family and my friends who are in it. I could jar more memories, but we'll just start here. The men were very dominant. The women were very submissive. There was community gatherings that took place every Sunday. I don't know how it works in a public high school, but they rent it out or however that works. The auditorium of the local public high school. And you would go do all of these prayers and people would come speak. And it was this charismatic prayer group and people would pray with their hands up and pray in tongues and that kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm telling you that for a reason, there's a background story. Just remember that. And so it, of course, of course, 
there was a basket that went around for checks for cash and you were asked to donate more and more and more and more and more. And I think it was like three or four hours on Sunday afternoon and we hated it because originally we were living on Long Island traveling for this. So we would have to go to Sunday mass, which was an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, drive an hour to New Jersey before we moved to New Jersey, do three or four hours at this community gathering and then an hour home. So it's like an eight hour day of just church praying and traveling. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you believe, but it was just so forced and it was, it just didn't feel right, if that makes sense. When we finally moved to New Jersey, we went to this school that they created because eventually they got kicked out of, of the Catholic church. So they got kicked out of the Catholic school. They created this school. The curriculum was ridiculous. To this day, the reason I don't know geography and the reason I can't do math, huh, math, I'll get there in a second, is because we didn't really have much of a curriculum. Well, first of all, we didn't have any geography. We had what you call joy of discovery. And they would take us, they would take the girls to people's houses and they would teach us how to sew. They would teach us how to basically be happy housewives that were barefoot and pregnant. We just learned how to be housewives. And that was literally a class that we took in school instead of science, instead of geography. We never had that. Math, this is funny. This is not funny, this is terrible actually. My sister and I are just very, very bad at math. Never were good at it. Remember, she's high school years. So she asked one of the teachers for extra help. She didn't understand how to do the assignment. Well, the teacher just so happened to be a coordinator, one of the big ups in this community. And they said to her, well, you don't know how to do math because you have the devil inside of you. You need to pray more. You need to pray that you could do math. You need to get Satan out of you. And it scared the crap out of my sister. Everything we did wrong, wrong, listening to the radio again was wrong. Wearing pants was wrong. Talking to a boy was wrong. Liking a boy and having some sort of emotional feelings around sexuality <gasps> was wrong. You were going straight to hell. It was this weird half and half situation where you were going to hell anyway, so you wanted to explore all of that stuff, but then the other side of you held you back because it was this crazy anxiety of eternal damnation. So I remember Mary and I, when we were in sixth grade, we figured out that all they wanted us to be was barefoot and pregnant. So if we didn't want to go to math class, not that it was much of anything, or gosh, what other, we had social studies. I think we had English. I do not remember any science. And it's crazy because I absolutely love science. I'm the best at like anatomy and physiology. But we never got anything like that. I guess just it's something that I've always liked. If I took a liking to it, I would want to learn it. I don't remember what other subjects we have, but math especially we both hated. So we would walk up to the office. Of course, it was probably one of the coordinator's wives who was a secretary. And we would say, we'd really like to clean the kitchen for you today. And they would say, oh, okay because they didn't have to do it. And we were being good little girls, good little girls who they were gonna groom into being wonderful stay at home barefoot housewives that doted on our husbands and did everything the men told us to do like perfect little community girls. So they let us skip whatever class we wanted and we would just hang out and like clean the kitchen. We would just wipe the same part of the counter over and over and over again, watch the boys play outside at recess and giggle like little seventh grade girls that we were. At recess, the only sport the girls were allowed to play was volleyball because that was the only feminine sport. Everything else was masculine and girls were not allowed to do that. My dad told me a story the other day. He said that when my brother was in fourth grade, a little boy had gotten in trouble in his class and it just so happened it was a party. The kids had brought in snacks and all kinds of stuff from home for the celebration. So this little boy gets in trouble and he's sent out to stand outside of the door while the rest of the kids are having a party. My father told me that my brother had stuffed his pockets with whatever he could fit in them and then he asked the teacher if he could go to the bathroom. So he goes out in the hallway and he brought the little boy the snacks that he wasn't allowed to eat because my brother's heart broke for him. He felt bad for him. The teacher saw this happen and one of the coordinators, the top guy called my dad to tattle on my brother. And my dad said that was when his wheels kind of started spinning, that something was off and wrong here. He's like, why are you, you're being so hypocritical. You're teaching good and how to be good people. My son was being a good person. He said another thing happened. My sister was at one of the school events or at a gathering or something like that. And he got a call from this 
coordinator. And he said that my sister was a horrible girl. She had the devil in her because she wasn't praying with her hands. She wasn't praying charismatically. She didn't feel the spirit in her that made her hands go up. And my father said he just kind of went along with it because he didn't really know what to do. But he goes, how do you force somebody to do that? Because that's supposed to be a feeling that rises up inside of you. That's not supposed to be forced. There's a lot of stuff that happened with the little boys that a lot of the boys won't talk about. A lot of the boys wound up with really serious drug problems. A few were just in and out of horrible relationships because there was a lot of abuse. I, there was talk of being lined up and beat with broomsticks. I wasn't exposed to that, thank God. Oh, I remember for class, they would make us pray the rosary for two hours a day, which again, there's nothing wrong with that, but you also need to teach kids. They were extremely, extremely against anything sexual you were going straight to hell. I think the worst thing for me and what's caused all of my anxiety in my life was that they were really, really big into reminding you. They would always say this phrase, nobody knows the day or the hour. I keep doing, this is like my air quote video. I'm sorry guys, but just bear with me. There was this phrase, it's in Revelations in the Bible. And they say, nobody knows the day or the hour, meaning it's, all about the second coming of Christ. And the way that they explained it to us, or at least the way my seven-year-old mind interpreted it, was that God was gonna part the sky. It was gonna open up and he was gonna be so pissed off at the way that the world was running. And the skies were gonna open up and it was gonna rain fire. And he was gonna ride in on these chariots. And then he was going to, oh, this is bringing up memories. Okay, it was called Judgment Day. And he was going to judge every single person that was on the planet one by one, and everybody would just have to sit through all of this. Which, side note, confession was a big thing. They would always make you go to confession. And the way that they taught this to you, I think it's like a little step further than Catholicism. That's when you would have to go to a priest and confess all of your sins. And that's how you would get absolved from your sins. But the problem was that they would teach you, if you didn't tell this priest every single sin that you committed, then you were going to hell. So if you left anything out, isn't that a way of controlling somebody so you know every single thing that they've done? But I remember being seven or eight years old and there's two options for confession. You can go face to face to the priest or you can go, it's called behind a screen. So you don't see their face and they don't see your face. You just go into this dark little phone booth looking type of a thing. And there's a curtain that you pull back and there's a screen and it's supposed to see, I'm sure you guys have seen it in like mafia movies. You're supposed to see just like a dark screen and the priest's face is this way, the screen's here. So there's not supposed to be looking at you. So I went to the screen one time when I was seven years old and I remember going in there and I remember thinking to myself, Oh my goodness, if I forget just one little lie that I told my mom that I don't even remember that I told my mom or one little bad thing that I did, one little thought in church about a little boy that I thought was cute and I'm going to hell. So I got this wave of anxiety and panic through my body. That's the very first time that I actually remember serious anxiety. I've had it ever since. I ran out of there. I ran out of there. I actually waited like a second and I could hear the priest saying, hello, hello. I waited long enough for my mom to think that I confessed my sins and then I got out of there. And I remember my mom asking me, you're done already? And I was like, well, I didn't do anything. I didn't do that much. I'm a good little girl. <laughs> yeah, right. That just jarred that memory. So back to the rapture, the, the second coming, Armageddon, whatever you guys want to call it, whatever you've heard of it. And let me stop myself. If you believe in this happening, if you believe in the Bible, please don't think that I am saying anything against your beliefs. I am not disrespecting your beliefs. You have every right to believe whatever you believe. What I am saying is how it was drilled into my seven-year-old mind was extremely traumatic. I don't believe in it, but if you do, I respect you and your beliefs, but please understand the difference. I am not coming down on people that believe in revelations or the Bible. I'm just coming down on this cult way of using it to control people and to lead people by fear. Okay, so they told you that God had, was gonna come down on his chariots and there was gonna be judgment and there was gonna be fire and that was gonna be the last day of your life and then either you were gonna be led up into heaven or you were gonna go to hell. Or purgatory, which is like this middle area where you're suffering severely, you're suffering a lot, a lot of this was all about suffering. And I'll get to that in a second, but you're suffering a lot. So you can eventually go to heaven and nobody knows how long it'll take to get there, but it could take like 
millions of light years. It's like ridiculous. So you really don't want to go to purgatory, but you're probably not going to go straight to heaven unless your mother's Teresa. So everybody else is just probably going to hell. Like awful. I remember being a child, seven, eight, nine years old, where I would fall asleep on the couch on a Friday night. I didn't have school the next day. We would be allowed to stay up a little bit later, but I was a kid. So I'd fall asleep on the couch and an airplane would fly overhead. <gasps> I would wake up at my sleep. Oh my God, that's it. This is it. This is it. It's coming. And I would have the worst anxiety attacks that that was the second coming of Christ. And this would last throughout the night, almost every night forever. And if I told my parents about it, they would say, well, what, what have you done wrong? Not trying to calm the anxiety, not trying to say that's not what's going to happen. Well, nobody does know the day or the hour. So what have you done that you think that you're going to hell? I just remember being like, well, I, I, I maybe forgot a lie or, or the fact that I ate a cookie when I wasn't supposed to, or the fact that I wanted to go to the mall and buy a pair. Oh, we did. Mary and I went to the mall. <laughs> we went to the mall and we went to that store Learner back then. That's how many years ago that was. I think that's called New York and Company now, but it's called Learner and it was our favorite store. And we both bought these jean shorts. And they were like Bermuda jean, jean shorts because that's what was in style. And they had like this little fold up and they came this much above our knee, if not they hit our knee. But we weren't allowed to wear jeans or shorts. Hers were denim color. Mine were this green khaki color with this white daisy pattern going through it. And we snuck and we bought them and we would put them on underneath our skirts. And when we would go out somewhere, we would take our skirts off and it was like, we were so badass because we got to wear shorts. And that's how crazy it was. Like when we would play volleyball at school, we would have to put our shorts underneath our skirts. We weren't allowed to wear gym clothes. As you got older, rules got stricter, but oh my God, there's so many things that I'm forgetting. And it was bad. It was bad. And I want to remind you guys that a couple people didn't understand the difference. I did not live on a commune. It was a community. So we didn't live all together in one area, except for that one, I almost said the name of the street, that one road that all of the coordinators lived on that everybody aspired to be like. But I guess that was the closest thing to a commune, but you could come and go as you please. The parents had right, well, the men had regular jobs. Oh, I forgot this one. When I was in sixth grade, I was 11 years old. My teacher was one of the coordinators that started this whole thing. Eventually he left his job on Wall Street. Think about this, you guys. And he became a teacher for this little private school because they didn't have enough teachers. How do you go from a private school salary to that salary unless you're embezzling money from a community of religious people, donating it to your little churchy community thing? His daughter, I think is probably six, seven years younger than me. If that, well, if I was 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, yeah, probably around there. You see, I can't do math. And he told us this story. First of all, you did this to your kids. Second of all, you're telling this to 11 year olds. He was so proud of telling the story. There was a huge bug, the way he described it and the way my sixth grade mind interpreted it was like a cockroach. And it was crawling, and I don't, I don't really know what it was, but he said it was a big bug crawling across the floor. And his daughter, who was five or six at the time, was petrified of this bug. So he said to her, go pick it up. And she was like, I'm scared. And she started to cry. And he said, go pick that up. If you believe in Jesus and you believe that Jesus loves you, that bug won't harm you. If you love Jesus, you need to pick up that bug. And he forced her with her hands to pick up that bug. Why? She was scared. She was a four or five, six year old kid. Ugh. That's why I think that they're saying that there's actually PTSD related back to these types of religious upbringings, overly evangelistic, overly culty religious upbringings. And I know that I feel like, I feel like you guys let me know, but I feel like I'm not doing it enough justice because I feel like I've blocked a lot of stuff and I'm forgetting a lot of stuff. And you tell me, maybe I'm coming across sounding better. Maybe I'm coming across sounding like, like it's not a big deal, but oh my God, I just I feel like I'm, my thoughts are all over the place. I tried to take notes for this. Actually, as I was listening to the Testament, which is the second version of The Handmaid's Tale, so much stuff was coming up around it. I really wanted to take notes, but I was driving. I tried to listen to it the other day at work and I just got too distracted. But in this podcast I was listening to said, most people that were raised like this are really good at punishing ourselves because we equate pain with suffering 
with love. We're taught in these cults, in these overly religious upbringings, that we need to suffer and God will reward us for suffering. Because if you do something wrong, you need to repent, you need to suffer. We don't know what pleasure feels like because we were never allowed to feel pleasure. So a lot of people that come out of these things have a twisted feelings about sexuality, have a really hard time reaching the big O. Thank God that was not a problem for me as I got older, but I also removed myself from it from for a long time. But there's a lot of shame and guilt and scars associated with sexuality, with making money, with being a woman who is firm in her own beliefs and can stand on her own with being an independent woman. There's also a lot of pleasure in suffering. So I was telling my friend the other day, I was raised like this and I wanted to say like, I turned out okay, but I, I still have severe, severe anxiety constantly about everything. A lot of times deal with self-loathing, 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 horrible self-talk, self-esteem issues, not deserving because we were always told you don't deserve that. Kids don't deserve that. You're going to hell. You're a bad kid. Always being the bad kid. Just a lot of issues. I could put myself through so much torture and pain because in a weird way that is comfortable. Pain is comfort because that's what you know and that's how you get pleasure because being able to suffer is how you get to the next step of acceptance and love from this God who is in their minds wrathful and tortures you in order for you to get his love. And how does that make any sense? Because looking back as an adult now, and again, I do not mean to hurt anybody, I don't, do not mean to disrespect anybody's beliefs, but in my adult opinion, and we can agree to disagree, what kind of God tortures you? They always taught that God is love, but he was so angry at you and everything was taught is money is the root of all evil. God is a wrathful God. I knew the word wrath. I knew the word secular. So many words that I should not know at 11 years old, nine years old, seven years old. I just don't think that an all loving, almighty, all knowing God is going to just damn you for having a human experience, for feeling pleasure, for wanting to wear pants, for wearing pants. It does not make any sense to me whatsoever. My parents started questioning things with that thing with, oh, okay, wait, the thing with my brother going to the school party and giving that little boy who was punished extra food and then my sister getting in trouble for not praying with her hands and in tongues or whatever it was and then I think the Catholic Church at this point this many years later put something out about them saying that it is a cult it is absolutely 100% they are not associated and a lot of people started leaving and my dad said and thank God thank God thank God my best friend Mary's parents were very instrumental in helping my parents get out. And I remember being over Mary's house with my parents. I would be playing with Mary and they would be there for hours and they would be talking about this stuff and they would be uncovering a lot of the stuff that happened. I was such a young kid. I don't remember a lot of it. Mary probably does because her parents knew it all. My parents didn't tell us. At that point, we were leaving anyway. It didn't really matter. We were going to public school at that point. And my dad just told me recently, actually, Mary and I went to lunch at his restaurant and he told the both of us that for a long time, they were ostracized and when they would see these people out and about in town sometimes they would go separately to their church they couldn't go as a community of people but if they didn't go to their homemade church they would go to my parents church and they would just ugh, they would look them up and down like they were the devil's spawn they didn't want to talk to them they were going to hell they had this elitist attitude it was very strange and then believe it or not a whole handful of them came to my mom's funeral, came to my mom's wake actually. It was my sister Christina, my older sister, me, my dad in a receiving line, and then the rest of my siblings were, and their significant others were over there. I think Christina's husband was over there as well with them. Christina and I were kind of just keeping everybody moving because there were I think 700 people at this wake. And I remember this one woman came in and she was wearing, <laughs> after all of this they have to wear their jumpers and this and that, this fire engine red dress that to me was like, look at me, I'm here. Her husband started giving us this religious lecture. And I looked at Christina out of the corner of my eye and I was like, get rid of him. Like, you know how you could talk to your sister with just eyes? Christina's the more outgoing one of the two of us. You know how that 
personality where you can say something and not say it. She's like the nicest bitch you'll ever meet. Like she, and she's not a bitch. I wish I was like that where she could say a word and just get them to move along. But this guy was going in Bible stuff, this and that. You're not appropriate. You're at a funeral. Like I was like, because here's the thing. I have a lot of anger built up. I feel bad because anytime I have to go to church for a wedding, for a funeral, anything, I have a lot of anger inside of me from a lot of the stuff that I've been through. So it's not a pleasant experience ever. The other day we went to go see the Radio City Rockettes. We took my nephew, my dad, a couple of my cousins came, my sister, her kids, a few of my sisters came. And afterwards we went to go see the tree in Rockefeller Center. And we, right there, it's a block up the road, is St. Patrick's Cathedral. So my dad wanted to go in and light a candle for my mom. And we walked in and mass was going on. This happened to be on a Sunday evening. And I just remember being like, I don't want to be in here. I, I can't get out of here fast enough. How awful is that? The culture, the tradition, the beauty inside of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, people pay boatloads of money to to get married in there. And I'm like, get me the heck out of here. I'm going to have an anxiety attack because a lot of my trauma stems around being inside of these churches. And like I said, the confession and being told that I'm not gonna amount to anything and every day I'm going to hell. Oh, and then you wonder why when I was older, I got involved in a crowd that did drugs and I got involved in a crowd that sold drugs. And I got involved in a crowd of people who lived on the edge because I was going to hell anyway. So I'm gonna leave it there. I don't know if I did any justice to this or not. I think that'll be a part one. You guys can ask me questions because I just, again, I feel like I'm just making it out to be not nearly as bad as it was. And I think it's not coming across right. I'm forgetting things. And I just don't know how to pass along the torture <laughs> until, I don't know, Mary help me. Oh, there were so many things. We were not allowed to date. My God, I was never allowed to date. We weren't allowed to date. We weren't allowed to wear makeup. I think my first boyfriend was at 19 years old because I was away at college and nobody knew. We weren't allowed to go to anything that related to school that wasn't religious. <laughs>